Private Lender Podcast, Episode 67. The Private Lender Podcast quote of the day comes to us from Thomas J. Stanley, who said, One of the reasons that millionaires are economically successful is that they think differently. This is the Private Lender Podcast, the show that shares practical advice and know-how for new and seasoned lenders, from private mortgages on single-family houses to joint ventures on commercial projects and beyond. Discover details about investment vehicles that you won't find at your local bank or online broker. Listen and learn from private lenders and real estate investors, as well as from professionals and entrepreneurs, as they share the details, strategies, and the insight that allows for successful and prosperous lending. Now, get ready to increase your ROI. Here's your host, Keith Baker. Most humble greetings from the energy capital of the world, Houston, Texas. Welcome to the Private Lender Podcast, the only place to be if you're looking for practical, no-nonsense tips and advice on becoming the bank and a successful private mortgage lender to real estate investors. If you're looking to take control of your investments and to build wealth without banks or Wall Street by utilizing time-tested methods in this ever-changing digital cattywampus world, then you, my friend are in the right place. My name is Keith Baker, and I'd like to welcome you to episode number 67, which is a solo cast. So I'm just going to rant and ramble on today. So buckle up, buckaroo. Here we go. (laughs) Today's topic is going to be twofold, two topics, really. And then I'm going to do some free shameless promotion of another podcast that uh, I've gotten into here recently, and I'm going to share it with you. Most likely, it's going to be very long winded, but let's go ahead and get into the heart of the matter, down to the brass tacks. The topics today, number one, in the spirit of full disclosure, I've got to own up and um, admit that I've gotten myself a little behind the eight ball, financially speaking. And I I tend to do this every few years. And uh, then, you know, now I have to go into defense mode and uh, clean things up, get back right again, and um, try to prevent uh, this from happening again. But uh, I decided to bring it up today to share it with you guys. So I guess a little bit of free therapy for me to work through it, but also to to put it out there and see if you guys are guilty of the same thing. And if so, you know, let me know. Write me. Let me know how you deal with it and um, what you do to try to prevent these things. The other thing I would like to talk about today is uh, because of my my current <laughs> situation, I attended a, a relatively inexpensive marketing seminar in Dallas a few weeks ago, which really helped turn a switch in my head, uh, which I'll get to that in another, another episode sometime later. But uh, it was you know, very uh, transformational in terms of thinking, especially you know, I think how marketing and business and yada, yada, yada. So very much worthwhile. But what even made it really cool was during one of the breaks, there was this real estate agent, kind of high end. You, you, know, you can tell the high end realtors, right? And sure enough, that was her niche was kind of the high end in Houston which you know, is like a bungalow in California, price-wise. But anyway, she and I had a really good conversation about where we just kind of gave our opinions on where we thought the market was from a retail side and an, an investment side. And yeah, it was, uh, it was really cool. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it. And uh, it, it looks like there we might have uh, you know, the April showers may bring some glorious May flowers. So we'll see if this market is um, back on the mend in, in, in bull territory. But before I get on my soapbox and talk about my uh, my lack of financial stability and sense, uh, <laughs> I just want to ask uh, one simple question, and that is, can the Astros have a better season than their one in three start would indicate? I don't know. It's a small thing to ask, uh, not to go sports fan on you, but um, you know, it's just one of the problems we've had this week. It's one of my 99 first world problems that I have, and yeah, I'm definitely grateful for every one of them. And speaking of gratitude, I'm grateful that you're listening to my nasally and self-righteous voice. I do appreciate it. Okay, so I need to get into the heart of the matter. And um, I'm going to start off by, uh, I want to cry in my whiskey. Yeah, um, what happened? You know, how did I get myself in this pickle to where I had to go into uh, sort of uh, one of the contingency accounts? And I will answer that quite simply. I committed some very old and rookie mistakes, cardinal sins. I knew better, but uh, you know these things happen. <laughs> so I counted the chick my chickens before they hatched. Right? I had uh, had a few pretty sizable deals that uh, I was trying to put together, and uh, some real estate deals, and they 
uh, one by one, uh, two of them, they, they fell apart. It just didn't happen. And that's part of the game, you know, that occurs. But I thought I could rebound a little bit quicker. Basically, I counted on money I didn't have in that case. And I did it again where I have uh, negotiated some changes in my employment and income. But those plans have had to go on hold for a little while. So while I was thinking January would be a much greener month financially, some of those things have gone on hold. And um, it's going to be a few more months. So really can't talk too much more about that. Other than, again, I made the mistake of counting some chickens before uh, the, those eggs hatched. And here, here's the one that I love the most is that um, I had done my planning for this year, assuming positive cash flow and profitability. Uh, or, or not so much profitability, but near profitability for the podcast. And um, not quite there yet, but uh, I had more exp- I added some more expenses so I could buy some time, get some time back for the kids and whatnot. And let's just say that my perseverance and stubbornness turned to, you know, or what started as perseverance became stubbornness. And I basically ended up just sticking my head in the sand. And um, I didn't want to admit I was wrong. I could do it to myself, but I didn't want to, you know, to the wife or anybody else. So I figured, you know what, let's start by admitting it to the three people who are listening this week. And um, so that's why, you know, anyway, that's why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm recording and releasing this episode to get it out as, as fast as I can. Because of the thing I need to do is to stop. I need to turn and, and look, you know, that fear in the eye and then run straight towards it and admit it to you guys that, you know, I've, I realize that with, you know, what's, what self-awareness I have, I, I, I've done a pretty good job of playing offense, but um, pretty much removed myself from the game of defense for about a year. And that'll never get the job done. You'll never get anything accomplished if you do that in the long run. So it's, um, it's a good point for me to say, whoa, let's pump the brakes. And I'm not going to lose the house, but um, I see a trend that I want to reverse. So wh- what do I do? Okay. Trend is uh, more money going out than, than coming in. So that's a pretty quick fix. I just go full Dave Ramsey, you know, and do the baby steps. Start it over again. I, you know, I've done this before. Uh, before I got introduced to Dave Ramsey, I um, got into a really bad pickle. And well, I got into a pickle where I didn't have any contingency plans or contingency accounts or any way to absorb things or any insurance policies or anything in place that I had no stable uh, floor back then. So there, that is different. Um, it's a big difference now. But you know, I took the cheapest debt that I had it was all credit card debt back then, and I started paying it off. I got sued by Chase. You know, good times. I got my my truck was repossessed when uh, my wife was <laughs> pregnant with our first kid. I can't recommend that that experience and that feeling enough to uh, anyone who thinks that they got their uh, financial sh- together, so to speak. So I worked it. I mean, basically, I did. I started with the smallest debt and paid it off, and then just took that money. You know, did the snowball and the compounding effect that Dave talks about and does so well. So you know, the sooner I do this, the sooner we're back on track, and the sooner I feel a lot more comfortable about things, particularly the future and you know, costs that are coming up uh, up ahead. Uh, you know. I'll have kids driving in college and, um, you know, like I said, 99 uh, first world problems. Grateful for everyone. But this is where my mindset's at. So I'm cutting back and I'm not going to any more seminars, big expos on, on anything like I did last year. I won't be going to podcast movement this year. I might do a few things digitally for a few hundred bucks, but cutting way, way back on that stuff uh, for now. I'm gonna, still going to spend money, but I'm going to direct it elsewhere. So I won't, I won't be sponsoring some of the things that I normally do. Um, I'll still be uh, sponsoring 713 RIA, but I won't have a booth at the Quest IRA Expo this year, unfortunately. But I do intend to sponsor in some form, shape, or somehow, some way. I've just got to chat with them a little bit. But I, I certainly will be there all three days. So please come on out. That's going to late August, around the 25th. So basically, do the Dave Ramsey thing then. I'm currently reviewing the uh, situation. I want to put the, myself and the family in a better position before the next downturn, because I'm not so sure when it's going to be, you know, when the real good buying opportunities are going to be. So what that does mean is I want to put myself into a place where I, I don't need credit, right? So get the mortgage paid off, all the credit cards uh, down, which are, most of them are just one. I do have one, I admit, that uh, is, has a rather high utilization, but uh, the rest of them are there for emergencies. But I usually try to pay the, the big one off as much as I can and keep a small balance. But I'm an American. I was raised by people who said, you know, patience is a virtue, but if you can't afford it now, you can always, uh, you can always make payments. But yeah, so uh, anyway, uh, I don't want to need credit because that's when you can get as much credit as you want is when you don't need it. 
I know it doesn't make sense, but it's true. If you know, when you need credit, nobody's going to give it to you. If you need money on a house and I smell that desperation, I'm not going to loan to you. <laughs> you know? So yeah, I want to put myself and my family in a position where we don't we don't need credit. So that's a personal goal, which really doesn't have much to do with private lending, but it's um I'm putting myself out there might as well admit put the warts out there as well um, from time to time. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's like a, it's, a, it's like a challenge or something. I don't know. It's um pretty idiotic, but yeah, so do what I got to do and get to the position where I don't need credit and have such a low personal and business, you know, credit util- utilization score that the banks throw themselves at me like, like gold diggers at, at a funeral or a or a Homer Simpson man child when he meets uh, gets around an attractive lady. The takeaway from this uh, number one point, ladies and gentlemen, is Keith Baker says, do not follow my path to extinction. And for you fans of the Beat Generation, you'll, you're screaming right now that I stole that from Allen Ginsberg, and you are correct. So let's get on to point number two, a little marketing seminar. I went up to, I went up to Dallas at the crack of dawn uh, one morning a couple of weeks ago. So during the break, I, um, great, great conference, by the way, you'll hear all about it later, but or a some conference seminar, marketing seminar, a real how to hands on, not like, not like, you know, just build your list, you know, and then you can put people, you know, you can sell things. No, it, it was more, it was more about building brand and um, transparency and basically kind of where social media is going and, and advertising and whatnot. Great, great, great seminar. Anyway, uh, so the realtor I spoke with, we, uh, was during break, we found out we were both from Houston. And she does the the higher end kind of stuff, right? So I asked, you know, what's your opinion? I told her my, you know, she, what, what do I think about where the market is? And I say, you know, on the retail side in my neighborhood, I see, I'm seeing the days on market go up. And my house is just over the uh, the median home price for the the greater Houston area. So it's not like I'm in an, in an exclusive neighborhood uh, by any means. I'm certainly not in a war zone though. So, so there's your spectrum. But figure out where I live there. Anyway. Like I said, 99 first world problems, people. Anyway, so uh, I said that's, that's what I'm seeing in my neighborhood. And as far as um, from a retail perspective, I'm seeing days on market increase in my neighborhood, which is not gated. It is master planned. So before you sneeze and wipe your nose, you got to ask the uh, homeowners association's permission. But you know, so they do try to keep the values up, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's suburban, west side, exclusive. Uh, <laughs> anyway. That's what I've been seeing from a retail. And then the houses by my ha- uh, my office are older. They're kind of getting, um, they're getting torn down. They got decent sized lots. So they're getting torn down and the mansions are going up. So they're, these houses are selling $400,000, which is a heck of a lot more than my neighborhood. But uh, <laughs> as the old ones are selling for four hundred, dollars and when they tear them down, build the new McMansion, they're going, they're on the market for $1.2, $1.3 uh, And I see a lot of days on market on that end as well. So kind of from the upper edge of the middle to the upper uh, the Houston area. I'm not talking like River Oaks or Medical Center uh, Museum District or anything like that. But, you know, that's what I'm seeing from retail. And on the fewer and fewer wholesale leads come through the mailbox. Now, you know, in full defense, that could be spam filters as well. Uh, but, I, you know, I have a special account that I use for keeping the uh, – Emails from wholesalers and whatnot, and you know the deals are they're getting thinner, margins are getting thinner, and at least that's what I'm seeing. I'm not seeing a whole lot. I'm not that active as um, I have been in the past from uh, an investing side. More, um, you know, obviously last year lending and, and podcasting. So that's kind of what I'm seeing. And I asked her, you know, I felt like that uh, we, you know, Wall Street kind of had that little ten percent correction a while back, and I I felt like. Yeah, I wasn't so gloomy and doomy anymore, thinking that if we are in a correction, I, f- I figured it'd be a little worse, a little more dire, especially as prices are dropping down. And she concurred that, you know, at one point they were having bidding wars on every house and that dried up. And she says now, though, she thinks that, that we have seen the correction in the Houston real estate market, especially in the higher end. And that, um, yeah, it's going to be some sunny skies ahead for a little while, which could be good news for a lot of people, especially if you're uh, you're in it for the long haul on the equity side of things. and as you know, someone who lends against values of property, then I, you know, I'm, I'm all in favor of that. Of course, as someone who invests, I do want the occasional correction, and I know that seems vicious, but it just it's, to me, it's just all part of the system. It's just a natural cleansing, and um, that's where money's made. So, 
I found it very interesting uh, that this, you know, this lady, from an investor, I, I look at tons of zip codes. And this lady works with like, like a handful in the good spots of Houston. And she said that her, uh, her last three listings that closed, that they had bidding wars push the sales price above the asking price. I said, okay, well, if the high end is doing that, then maybe that's a sign of uh, things turning around here in Houston. So I don't call the shots. Um, unfortunately, I can't look forward. My crystal ball cracked uh, when I was a kid. I had a little magic eight ball, you know. I asked it if like, that, you know, that, that one girl in front of me in class liked me, you know. It doesn't look good. Anyway, so that's all busted. But uh, I'm going to link to an article from the Houston Chronicle, the Houston Comical. It came out in January of this year talking about how 2018 was a you know was a you know banner year in the Houston area as far as sales and uh, it looks like tw- there's a stall on on with 2019 but hopefully uh, as typical regular press is they're a little bit behind on this um, and you know by maybe August we'll say well it's you know doing pretty good we'll see what the uh, the summer sales season and you know everyone moving for schools and all that we'll see what happens so go to the show notes to for that article you can click to and um, yeah. So that's, um, I guess, business portion of this episode. So a quick recap, number one, I got myself in a bit of a pickle and I'm mad at myself because I don't have more money to loan in addition to, you know, not handling money correctly and, and thinking, oh, I can get away with it. I can get away with it. I can fl-. You see, the problem is, guys, and, and I know my listeners know this, so I'm not talking to any millennials, but I grew up, when I turned 16, I grew up, I learned how to float a check until payday. And I don't care if you're on a treadmill, be careful, don't raise your hand, but raise your hand. Raise your hand right now. You're listening. You're old enough that you learn how to float a check. And I'm talking like as soon as I got a job at the movie theater and I got like a weekly or biweekly paycheck, I'd go to the bank, I'd cash it, I'd pluck all the money out I could. And I'd, you know, I'd go buy things that I needed, you know, like um, cigarettes or um, music or drum heads and, uh, <laughs> you know, important things. But yeah, I, I got paid every Friday, but I knew I could, I could write a check as late as like late Tuesday night. I could write that check and my paycheck would be in the account before my check went to the convenience store, to their bank, to my bank, to my account. And unfortunately, old habits die hard, especially when you get a little, you get a little bit ahead. And then I'm, I'm, I'm so bad as I get a little bit ahead. And then it's like, I, I party a little too hard. You know, it's like, um, you, you win district, you don't act like you just won the Super Bowl, you know, <laughs> and complacency. Uh, this is something I fought and saw a lot in the oil field. And, um, yeah, it's just complacency people, you know, it's just part of being human, but there's no excuses. So I've, you know, taken it upon myself and, um, by you, thank you for listening to me babble through it. Cause it, it's going to help me uh, in the end with, um, with who and what I want to be. Uh, so yeah, there we go. And, and the other thing, you know, let's look at this market. You know, I don't know. I called it actually, I think I did call, but I remember flying back from Philadelphia last year after podcast movement 18. And the guy's talking about, hey, no, we're going we're gonna to do just like this guy did in Philly, blah, blah, blah. And that's, I was like, hmm, I wonder if it's time. But um, this is, uh, we're in interesting times. So just another way of saying, hey, look, there's another sign. Maybe it means something. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know, but I figured I'd share it with you, especially if you invest or loan, uh, lend in the uh, greater Houston area. So, okay, a couple of episodes ago, I introduced you to Andy Frisella and the MFCEO project. I've got another cursing freak for you. And it's funny because the, the, the person, uh, you know, and I'm going to draw this out as long as I can before I tell you who it is. So just deal with it. Sorry. You can go ahead and cut, turn it off or fast forward about five minutes. <laughs> I just go to the show notes page. <laughs> yeah. Just stop listening. That's fine. <laughs> wow. Okay. Anyway, that's podcast 101 right there, people. That's how, you, that's how you keep an audience. Tell them to stop listening. But no, but seriously, it, it's, a, it's a guy who, um, I don't know when I, uh, I, I, I got turned on to his work. Or found out about him. He just, you know, he was just kind of always there, you know. And to me, he's he's earned a spot on the Mount Rushmore of, of comedians of comedy, and he's he's got a spot firmly, uh, you know, not only in my heart but my wife's as well. So it makes it a, a little more special uh, that uh, you know, this is something we share together. One, I I find this guy. I love this guy's work. Then my wife, you know, it's rare that my wife and I find something, you know, because I, I want to watch Shark Tank and she wants to watch Hit Real Housewives or something, you know, whatever, something like that, you know, just. You know, who's, 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 anyway, never mind. Another time, another time. But I, you know, I'm going to get straight to the hate. And there are plenty of reasons for me to have an extraordinary amount of first world white on white, white on white hate between me and this comedian. Okay. He's got a similar heritage to me. He's a, he's a fellow drummer. 
He's completely miserable, has a temper just like me. And his, his wife is, is not white. Uh, I'm not going to say what she is, but it doesn't matter. It's just not one of our own, uh, like, like myself. Um, he didn't marry a white woman. Um, just a little interesting fact. Uh, you know, like me, uh, he's, uh, he sounds, he admits he's a fan of the bottle. Um, but unlike me, he's doing the right thing and he's taking a break. And uh, God bless him and uh, more power to him. But this is where it, it gets a little, a little difficult for me. And this is where it really touches home. And I, I got I to gotta take another swig of water before I get into this because it's, uh, I'm, uh, this is where it gets long-winded. So buckle up. All right. <clears throat> Let's see, but unlike me, this gentleman is not, I repeat, not a fan of the Dallas Cowboys, which, uh, you know, as you know, is America's team or is, since Trump was elected, I like to say America's team. But this, this gentleman who has a podcast and I'm going to recommend you listen to, suggest that you listen to him. He's... um. He's a Patriots fan. He's a Boston fan. He's a blankety blank Boston fan. And I still love this guy. Why? Because on the surface and on paper, you have to be logical about this kind of thing. That's his hometown team, right? He comes by it honestly. I'm the world's biggest Cowboys fan, but I was born and raised in Houston. That means I root for the Houston team, except when they play the Cowboys. I support him. I don't dog him. I support the hometown team. Even though my grandmother, who lived north of Dallas in southern Oklahoma, just on the other side of the Red River, made damn good and sure I was a Cowboys fan. Thank you, Graham. Love you. So, you know, the fact that this guy's a Patriots fan, you have to give him that because he's from there. It's not like he was, you know, grew up in L.A. and he's like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wear a Gronkowski jersey because, uh, you know, I want to look cool or something like that. All right, whatever. But I know for a fact this guy remembers Raymond Barry's second season as head coach of the, of the New England Patriots. And he probably remembers Marion Barry's third term and arrest in 1990. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. But I know for a fact, at least I think I know for a fact, that this gentleman is pod, whose podcast I'm speaking of, and this comedian, still has the wounds from the 1985 season that ended with losing to the Bears in Super Bowl twenty. That was in January of 1986. And yes, this is going to be probably my best, most well-researched show <laughs> episode. And it was in January of 86, and that's the last time I ever felt bad for the Patriots or a Boston fan. And let me, let me explain why, because I know you're asking, why, why, Keith, you don't have any empathy for them? And, and here we go. I'm stealing this guy's bit completely, but here we go. So in the early 80s, the Houston Rockets lost against the Celtics, right? And I think it was 81. And then in 1986... I watched the Celtics win yet another NBA Finals against the Rockets. The hometown Rockets, mind you. They swept the Rockets in four games on national TV. I was 12 years old. I felt so bad for those Rockets. And I hated, I hated those players for the Celtics. Bird, Parrish, and McHale. Mind you, if you're going to get swept, you know... <laughs> These are some good names to be swept by. But nonetheless, swept. I was devastated. All right? And then a few months later, it's a very good year. Good year for me. Um, it was a very good year. It's a year I got my first drum set at the end of it. But I had to go through this other stuff first. So let me, I'm sorry for boring you, but let me, get, let me get to this other stuff. So Rockets get swept by the Celtics in four games. And then the Astros start making, making a little wave, right? They're making, making a little run for it after the All-Star break. They're, you know. They're putting together the wins, you know, they're playing like a team, you know, all that, all that kind of cliche stuff. Uh, and they make it all the way to the NLCS that year. I mean, I'm talking, these are the, this, this is the Astrodome. The Astrodome Astros. And Nolan Ryan was on the mound. I saw Nolan Ryan, another rabbit hole squirrel. I saw Nolan Ryan go eight and a third. Eight and a third of a no-hitter on a Tuesday night against the Phillies. And then Mike Schmidt gets up. And he hits this, you know, decent shot. It wasn't like earth shattering. But in my head, it was this blooper bleeder BS of a hit. And he hit it over Billy Doran's head. Broke up the no hitter, right? I'm 12 years old. You know, if I have no emotional regulation right now, imagine what I was when I was 12. I'm standing, you know, sitting there with my dad. 
we got the free tickets because my mom worked for the school district, you know? So, bam. Anyway, just, just one of those typical Americana nights. Nolan goes eight and a third of a no-no, but one out in the, bottom, in the top of the ninth. And I cussed Billy Dorn. I cursed his name. I made my dad drive me to New Orleans, go to the house of voodoo <laughs> at 12. And, you know, it was just, hey, it was, it was one of those great moments, you know? But I always, I always held something in my heart against Bill Dorn. Until a few, you know, not too long ago, I saw a replay of that, that very game. And they, they showed Bill Doran on that play. And I don't, I don't think there's a human being that's ever tried to stretch his body as much as Billy Doran did that night. I mean, Bill knew what was at stake. You could see it on his face. And you, you just see the angst and the desperation of anything. You know, let it hit his glove. Let it be an error. You know, don't let it be a legitimate hit. And uh, so uh, to you, Bill Dorn, I uh, owe you an apology. I'm sorry about that. But nonetheless, uh, so that, that was this year, right? So, that, I mean, it's just, it's just going on. The Astros, they make it to the NLCS. And then uh, they get beaten six games by the New York Mets, who go on to play the Boston Red Sox in the World Series, who had not won a World Series in 68 years, and I could care less. That was my thinking. Your Celtics had just beat my Rockets. F you. You traded the great Bambino to the Yankees. Deal with it. Throw salt over your shoulders. Do whatever you got to do. You know? Wah. 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 <laughs> this is where I'm coming from, right? And then I watch that little grounder, Buckner. These people lost the Super Bowl. They won the NBA Finals. And after 68 years, they got a chance to reverse the curse, but they watch it dribble between Buckner's legs. I feel so bad for Buckner. So obviously, the man whose podcast, I, the man I'm referencing in his podcast I'm referencing is a Boston fan. But I'm the one who needs to man up and, and accept him. You know, I need to steal his bit a little more, but I need to accept him. I need to look him in his kraut mick eyes and shake his little ginger hand while he's wearing a Tom Brady or a Celtics uniform with a smile on his face. I have to do this because it's the right thing to do. And that's how my parents raised me, damn it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about a native of the Boston area. I'm talking about an underrated writer and performer, a genuine, a genuine comic genius. And this man will make you think. Und listen for the music, yeah? I'm talking about Bill Burr and his Monday morning podcast. What's that you want? A concrete example? Sure, here you go. What are you, a f <laughs> Just to rip off Bill's act a little more. On my recent trip to Dallas, I binged a few episodes of Bill's podcast. And on the way up that early morning, I got a real treat when I heard Bill introduce Les Claypool, who's the bass player and the singer, founding member of, of the band Primus. One incredibly badass bass player. Credits Getty Lee as one of his idols. So, you know, Les is in, in my book and in my heart. Right? But he took an hour. He and Bill took an hour out of my my mind-numbing interstate drive, and it just made it fly you know, before dawn, which was great. I thought that was like, oh, that's so amazing, <laughs> you know. And then, you know, I knew, I knew Bill had the drum, you know, thing, but this was, this was really, really a treat for me you know, driving up. I, uh, I remember seeing Primus back in the '91, right after uh, Seize the Cheese came out. Anyway, real treat. Then on my way home the following afternoon. I catch, uh, I think it was a new episode at the time. And then Bill introduces his guest, Stephen Perkins, the drummer for Jane's Addiction, Porno for Pyros, and, and, and anyway, the guy who wrote the drum part for three days. Been caught stealing, mountain song. Just, I've seen Jane's once, and unfortunately it was after Eric A. left. So I never saw the original lineup, but... Um, the bass player they had, you know, he filled in. Navarro was freakishly, I don't know, good, good looking. I, I don't know. He's just, I don't know. I think he might be the 28th gender. I don't know. There's something about him. I just don't know. Anyway, he just wailed on it, though. It was, it was amazing. Perry was Perry. And Stephen Perkins was, uh, anyway. I, I, so anyway, the, the point being, it's not just kind of, it's funny. You got to listen to it. Yeah, just go give him a listen. That's all there is to it. I think you'll laugh. You'll, you'll find some things out. He's very honest. Dude, there is an epidemic of gold digging in this country. 
And every night I put on the news and I'm waiting for someone to address it. You know, genuine admits, you know, he's got problems. So, you know, I guess that's why I came out on, on this one. I was like, hey, look, you know, put myself in the bind. I got I to gotta take my lunch to work for a few days. Yeah, wah, get out of it. Anyway, go check out Bill Burr. You can go to the uh, privatelanderpodcast.com show notes page. I have the links and everything to his podcast, to his website. He does, um, for some reason, people, you know, write in and ask him for like relationship advice. It's, I don't know when he became Dr. Drew, but you know, it's, uh, it's actually, it's actually pretty funny. And his, his ads are the best because he only accepts ads from people who will let him talk smack about their copy and make fun of them. So yeah, I think you'll, um, obviously don't, don't listen to it in lieu of my show, but I think you'll, uh, you'll get a kick out of it. So <laughs> anyway, the, um, the only price I ask for listening to this show is that you, uh, if you find any value in, in an episode, in, in any episode, is to please tell someone, someone different, you know, uh, that doesn't know about the show. Just ask you, introduce them to the Private Lender Podcast. You can, it's, I know it's hard to do, but you can do it by leaving a rating on iTunes because I think iTunes is set up to where they don't want people to leave ratings, but just scroll down at the bottom from the phone. You can leave uh, five stars. A little, you'll see the little five stars that are empty and you can do the review there. Uh, you can do it on Google Podcast, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Like I said, please help spread the word. Connect with me on the social media channels at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Bigger Pockets. And yeah, those are what, that's what I'm on. And all those links can be found at the privatelenderpodcast.com. And while I've got my hand out, um, I'm wondering if you could um, loan me a couple of bucks because I have a feeling that um, Bill Burr's attorneys are going to call me with or at least get a cease and desist letter or email for using his bits, but uh, I'm not making any money off of it. I just I honestly want to put it out there. You know, I think you might like, I love him. My wife loves him. He's, uh, he just seems like a, the kind of guy you just want to, you know, if you're going to go into battle or you're going to go into an Irish bar, it's good to have someone like Bill Burr on your side. So yeah, yeah start saving your money because I'm going to need bail money or lawyer money or something. Or you can just go see Bill in a concert. I know he just taped a special, but go see him live. And I just want to ask you uh, one more thing. Just please keep reaching out to me. I really do appreciate it. And I'll keep recording episodes. And I want to wish everyone who's listening happy and prosperous investing. Catch you on the next episode. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Private Lender Podcast with your host, Keith Baker. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit privatelenderpodcast.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review, and we'll catch you next time.